gentlemen. Uh, today we're going to discuss the ANOVA case. That's a, an abbreviation for something that statisticians call uh, the analysis of variance. And it's a device which we use to explore the consequences and interpret the results of the numerical evidence that we acquire. Now, in this particular instance, uh, we'll need some data, and it just so happens that I have uh, 10 observations here. So what do you say we begin with trying to explain away the sources of variability uh, of these particular uh, observations? All right, now let's go quickly to our work. If I were going to initially uh, uh, try to explain these data away, I might at first uh, 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 take the uh, idea that they were all uh, arriving or events from a, a single uh, cause, a single distribution, and I would be therefore quite keen to estimate the uh, mean and estimate the variance of these observations. So if we take the total of these observations, the total happens to be 60, and since there are 10 observations in all, then the average of these observations is six, and that would be my estimate of the mean. And now we have the problem of estimating the variance. And you'll recall there are uh, two equations we could uh, put to our use in this case. Um, take the sum of squares of deviations of the observations from their average and divide by degrees of freedom, n minus one in this instance, or we could take the alternative and equivalent formula for estimating the variance, get the crude sum of squares, the correction factor, take that quantity and divide by degrees of freedom. I'm going to use the second uh, form uh, for our calculation. The crude sum of squares of these observations is uh, 462. And now all we have to do is substitute in our equation. 462 minus 60 squared over 10. 60 squared is 3,600 over 10 would be 360. Uh, so that would give us an all 102, and there will be 9 degrees of freedom. And so the estimate of the variance would be 102 over 9. Now what I'm going to do is try to introduce you to the analysis of variance table. And all we're going to do initially is take these calculations and reshape them, put them in another format. However, this is, the analysis of variance table starts with a mathematical model. And so we're going to postulate an explanation to the data. We're going to say that each of the observations can be accounted for in a very particular way. And now let's proceed and see uh, where that leads us. Our mathematical model, the one we're initially entertaining in this case, is the following. We are going to declare that each observation, y sub i, is equal to a single constant, eta, the mean of the observations, if you will, plus a disturbance, epsilon. And we're going to assume that the epsilons are normally and independently distributed with mean zero and variance sigma squared. All right, now to start this analysis uh, off, uh, let's take a look at all the observations. And I'm going to display the observations horizontally now. There are the 10 individual observations we just saw on the board a moment ago. Now, here's our mathematical model. Let's estimate the parameters in this model. And the parameters, in this case, the only parameter we have really to worry about immediately is the parameter eta. And what would we use to estimate the mean? And you're all supposed to correspond back the grand average. And sure enough, each one of those observations will, first of all, uh, going to be, be, be partially explained away anyway in terms of the grand mean eta. But uh, or in our case, the estimate, which is six. Now, what we, the estimate will not equal what we observe in each case. This is the estimate of the mean. This is what we've observed, and there'll be a deviation. And that deviation, of course, is going to be our estimate of the little epsilons, which have uh, impinged on our data-taking procedures. And so I've calculated those little epsilons right here. I'm going to take the individual observations and subtract the grand average. You know, for example, we observed a five. Um, the, the average of all the observations was six. That's our estimate of the mean uh, for all these observations is six. And so the deviation we estimate in that case would have to be equal to minus one uh, to produce that observation five. Now, in an analysis of variance table, uh, we have various column or classifications. And one of them is called the sums of squares column. So let's look at the sums of squares column. The first thing I'm going to do is take the sum of squares of all the individual observations, and that equals 462. Now watch. I'm going to take the sum of squares of all these entries. That's 6 squared 10 times. And so the sum of squares of the, all the entries here in the um, 
Y bar uh, column or line will be uh, 360. And finally, I'm going to take the sum of squares of all those residuals. 2 squared plus 6 squared to dot of minus 5 squared and so on down the deck. And you'll find out if you do that, uh, that the sum of squares of all those residuals is equal to 102. And I want you to observe something very interesting right now. That is that the total sum of squares has, in a sense, been partitioned, been separated into two components. A component I can, in a sense, blame on uh, the estimate of the mean of the observations. And another component I can blame on or assign to the intrinsic variability of the data, the variability of those epsilons. There's another uh, column that uh, appears in all analysis of variance tables called the degrees of freedom column. The degrees of freedom column. We say we start out with 10 degrees of freedom because there are 10 observations in all. And so we begin our table, our column here, with 10 degrees of freedom. All right, gang, now, how many times did I work the data to get the estimate of the mean? And I use the data once. In other words, I work the data once to get the statistic y bar equals 6. And so we say that consumes or uses up a single degree of freedom. And so our estimate of the mean, the estimate of beta, costs us a degree of freedom. How many degrees of freedom, therefore, would be left over, remain? And there would be nine degrees of freedom remaining. We'd say that the residuals had nine degrees of freedom. And just about this time, somebody's going to raise his hand and say, but by golly, Stu, you've got 10 residuals there. And I'm going to say, yes, that's right. It would appear that I've estimated 10 statistics, not nine, that I've worked the data 10 times and not nine times. But it turns out that these residuals are constrained. They have to sum to zero. So you can give me any nine of them. So you compute any nine of them. And I could always tell you what the 10th one was. It would be fixed because their sum has to be zero. As a consequence of that, we say that the residual sum of squares has the remaining degrees of freedom, or in this case, would have nine degrees of freedom, one less than the total number of degrees of freedom. OK? Now, you will note that if I take the sum of squares of the residuals and I divide it by its degrees of freedom, right, I'll pull up and end up with the estimate of the variance. I'll have 102 divided by 9, or 11.3. That will estimate sigma squared, and sigma squared will have um, nine degrees of freedom. Well, this is just a, another way of separating out the calculations we've previously uh, done. Now, in the analysis of these data, I happen to have, as it turns out, some additional information. And really, this mathematical model is inappropriate, because I happen to know that the first four observations were done under one environment, which we'll call environment A. And the other six observations were collected under a second environment, which we'll merely call environment B. And so let's look at the separation of this collection of data into its two component parts. So here are the A data. These might be six observations taken on electrical motors, or the, uh, four observations, or um, these might, here's a collection of six observations. Uh, these four observations could be taken on motors of type A, and these six observations uh, on um, motors of type B, or these four observations on chemical process A, and these six observations on chemical process B. I, what I've done in this instance, I've taken advantage of this additional information to separate our 10 observations into two groups. OK, let's go quickly through the necessary calculations. Let's get the estimate of the mean of process A and the mean of process B. First thing I would have to do is get the totals, and then I would divide those totals down by their respective number of observations, and I'd quickly have uh, the estimates of the respective means. The average y bar A is 9, and the average y bar B is 4. And let's go quickly, without any bother, into getting the estimates of the variance. This is an estimate of the variance uh, determined from those four observations. It would have three degrees of freedom. Here's an estimate of the variance determined from those six observations with five degrees of freedom. The pooled estimate of the variance in this case would be a 42 over 8. And you recall how we get the pooled estimate of the variance. We take the individual estimates, multiply them up by their degrees of freedom, sum them up, and then divide down by the total number of degrees of freedom. What that means, in fact, is that we just take these corrected sums of squares for the averages under A and the corrected sum of squares for the averages under B, sum them, and divide down by the total number of degrees of freedom. So our estimate of the variance is 42 divided by 8, 5.25, and it has 8 degrees of freedom. All right. Now, 
Let's continue with this particular analysis. Suppose someone comes up with the hypothesis that there is no difference in the means of process A and process B. So he sets up the hypothesis there is no difference in the means. And so let's look at that hypothesis. He says that A to A minus A to B is equal to zero. And as you all know, under these circumstances, we could test that hypothesis in the light of our data uh, using the uh, T statistic. And here's our equation for T. There's the statistic, there's the quantity the statistic estimates, and we divide down by the square root of the variance of the statistic. And all I've got to do now is uh, plug in here and turn the crank. Let me see, y bar a was 9, y bar b was 4. The hypothesized value for a to a minus a to b in this instance is 0. Okay. There are four and six observations respectfully in those, uh, respectively in those averages, respectfully too. Right. And S squared, our estimate of the variance, we have to use the pooled estimate of the variance, you recall, is 42 eighths, 5.25. And how many degrees of freedom will this T end up having? And since S squared has eight degrees of freedom, we're dealing with a T with eight degrees. And if you were to turn that crank, you'd find out you'd get an observed value of t equal to 3.38. And now the crucial question is, is this an unusual value of t? Have a t with 8 degrees of freedom equal to 3.38. And we could answer that question very quickly by taking recourse to a, a table of the t statistic. And let's see, distribution of t, it says here, with 8 degrees of freedom. The critical value of t, that leaves 2.5% uh, in the tails of the curve, right? turns out to be 2.306. Now, pray, what's our observed value of t? And you will note that our observed value of t is uh, 3.38. So it's much farther out in the tail. This is a rare event t. Therefore, this hypothesis, right, ends up being rejected. We reject the hypothesis in the light of the present amount of information we have. And we declare it an inadmissible hypothesis, or at least we can't find it acceptable. It makes the event the thing that happened to me so extraordinary that I find it intolerable and so I just dismiss it.